tonight, the wonderful world of Disney presents Nature's Strangest Oddballs. What's a trouble, Buster? Scared stiff. I'm not scared at all. You're not? I'm just as big as you are. Well, that's not the point, kid. I'm a mouse. You're an elephant. <laughs> Wonderful world of Disney. Tonight, the wonderful world of Disney presents Nature's Strangest Oddballs. world-famous Museum of Unnatural History, a place devoted only to the strange and unusual creatures of nature. This evening, you will meet some of these odd creations, along with one who was probably the most oddball of all, no other than the curator, Professor Ludwig von Drake. Welcome, science lovers, to this great institution of scientific learning. As you can see, we have here a complete collection of every living thing on Earth. The only trouble is that they all dead. That's because it was the only way to stuff them. And the reason they are stuffed is so they will look more alive. <laughs> anyway, our subject is oddballs in nature. To the pride of the professor's exhibits, prehistoric animals. Now, to study oddballs, the best way is to go back 600 million years, when there was nothing but oddballs around. Isn't that something? Now, the science of prehistoric animals is called paleontology. And that's because you take one look at them and you turn pale. <laughs> These odd creatures lived during long and difficult periods, you know. Long and difficult to pronounce, that is. The Pleistocene, Pliocene, the Miocene, Oligocene, the Eocene, Kerosene, Keras... What am I saying? That's when we used to clean the floors. So we better shove the Kerosene behind the scene, where it can't be seen. Now, the professor has figured out why all these creatures was oddballs. And it's because when Mother Nature messed around with these early experiments, you gotta remember she was only a young chick herself. I wonder all these nutty models was obsolete before they even reached the sales floor. Case in point, this 40-ton Model A dinosaur. Where's the fuel intake, you ask? Where are you? And where is the engine? All the way down here. No pickup, no getaway. So, when the Ice Age came and it was time for him to get away, he did not get it away. Another early experiment was this oddball flying machine, answering to the delightful name of Ramphorhynchus. No wonder he couldn't figure out if he was a bird, a bat, or a reptile. Look at the clumsy wings, the top-heavy nose. Aerodynamically speaking, a thing like this could never, ever fly! These non-scheduled flights. You never know where you're going to end up. Which brings us to a very important question. 
You ask, if they are all extinct, then where do all these marvelous creatures come from? Answer, from shipping and receiving. Every day, carloads of fossils arrive from our naturalists in the field. They send in fossil remains, like old bones, teeth, hangnails, celluloid collars, barbie pins. Barbie pin? And then the museum scientist has got to be like a regular detective, and from a single clue, he must reconstruct the whole crime. For instance, from this petrified old footprint, we reconstructed this mighty Parasaurolophus, monster reptile of the Cretaceous period. This single toenail was a clue to Dimetrodon, a 10-foot lizard, 250 million years old. But sometimes we find a whole barrel full of bones. And what do we do in that case? We spread the fossils out on the floor. And the painstaking, methodical, scientific work can begin. The toe bone and connected to the ankle bone. The ankle bone connected to the heel bone. The heel bone connected to the foot bone. The foot bone connected to the shin bone. The shin bone connected to the leg bone. The leg bone connected to the hip bone. The hip bone connected to the trombone. And that's the way it's done. The tail bone connected to the backbone. The backbone connected to the rib rose. The rib rose connected to the shoulder bone. The shoulder bone connected to the neck bone. The neck bone connected to the Jaw bone, the jaw bone connected to the chin bone, the chin bone connected to the tooth bone, the tooth bone connected to the nose bone, the nose bone connected to the head bone, and now the whole thing is Whew. done. Well, what do you know? Tyrannosaurus Rex, no less. Isn't science wonderful? Look out! It's alive! <laughs> Tyrannosaurus Rex is right, only it's spelled wrong. Rex. <laughs> That's more better. All right, so now you know all about nature's oddballs of long, long ago. But I bet if you came face to face with one of them today, you would say, there ain't no such animal. But you would be wrong. First, because you was using a double negative and that's bad English. And second, because there is plenty of them around, if you know where to look. And the place to look is the museum movie screen over there. The professor has recently returned from a world trip where I personally filmed some of nature's strangest oddballs that is still living today. For instance, iguanas. Actually, they is very nice little fellas. Direct descendants of the dinosaurs the professor has shown you. And the Galapagos Islands is the only place where you can still find them today. Another loony oddball is the albatross of the Midway Islands in the Pacific. You remember what a pain in the neck he was to the ancient mariner? <laughs> well, he's even more of a pain in the neck to himself. Why? Because, aerodynamically speaking, he's a mess. Here he is with the longest runway on Earth, and he can't even get off the ground. Maybe it's because he's overloaded with fish. <laughs> Maybe he better go on a diet. Anyway, you can see why they call this aerial oddball a goonie. He is the world's greatest expert on crash landings. In fact, he holds all the patents on belly landings. Neck landings. And ground loops. But it is Australia that takes the cake for kooky characters. These giant bats think that because Australia is down under, they have got to live upside down. But I guess all bats is batty. Have you ever been called a fish out of water? Well, this Australian lungfish has. 
this scaly oddball has to wait for the tide to come in before he can swim out. And that's no fish story. And the frilled lizard here looks just like his monstrous prehistoric forebear. Only he is the modern compact model. One of the craziest mixed up kids is the duck-billed platypus. He's built from all the spare parts Mother Nature had left over after she was through with other experiments. He's got a bill like a duck, a tail like a beaver, a body like a reptile, and a fur coat like a coarse girl, uh, like an otter. And instead of giving birth to baby platypuses, they lay eggs. And Mama Platypus doesn't even nurse her offsprings like anybody else. No, sir. Her soft underbelly has got hundreds of milk pores. And the milk just pours through them for the little platypuses to nurse on. I guess that's because Mother Nature must have run out of spare parts just about then. Isn't that something? Here we got kangaroos and wallabies in the middle of July. What? Snow in July? <laughs> well, what do you know? Did you know that all baby kangaroos is called Joey? That's because they look so much alike, who can tell them apart anyway? Now, Joey is a marsupial. That means Mama carries him around in her shopping bag where he stays until summer. After all that time in such cramped quarters, coming out is like shedding your winter woolies. <laughs> Ooh, oh, that feels so good. However, with such short little arms, it's hard to reach the right spot. And so here's where the famous saying, you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours, was born. Oh, aren't they cute? The professor was lucky to capture on film an oddball that's even lower on the evolutionary scale than marsupials. This echidna, or spiny anteater, is sort of a four-legged vacuum cleaner. He has a mouth that's only a hole in his little snoot, from which he sticks his tongue out at everybody. And I mean sticks, because whatever he touches sticks to it, like ants and termites. What a guy to go into termite exterminating business with, huh? Or the stamp licking business? <laughs> Now, this bushy-tailed possum here lives in trees. Like kangaroos, possums is marsupials, which means that baby possums gets a free ride on mother's overhead monorail. Maybe in this case it should be called mama rail. Anyway, once you get used to this, it's pretty hard to break the habit. So what with the whole family and friends hanging on, maybe he should wait for the next bus. Whoops! There's always a taxi around. But nature's cutest oddball is the koala bear. What's oddball about him, you ask? Well, first, he's not even related to the bear family, even though our teddy bear was modeled after him. And you can see why. Now, the honey glider has a perfect name because that's exactly what he does. He glides after honey. Like our flying squirrel, he hasn't any wings, so he uses his square fur coat for sale. Now, taking off is no problem. The problem is in landing. I think the goonie bird's been giving him flying lessons. Look what he scared up, a frilled lizard, whose acquaintanceship we've already made, remember? Did you ever seen anybody head for home like this guy? <laughs> and that's what we are going to do now. Head for home from this wonderful land of oddballs. And so, science students, I hope I have convinced you that nature is still full of oddballs even today. But wait till you see what is coming next. You know, you don't have to look at ball to be at ball. But you ask, 
What about creatures that looks perfectly normal on the outside, but who is oddballs inside? You know, you find rare cases like that in the study of natural adaptation. For instance, it is normal that a camel never gets a heat stroke. Or that a polar bear or a penguin never gets frostbite. Isn't that sensational? <laughs> no, it's natural adaptational. At least that was my theory, until it got knocked for a loop. And this happened when I became shipwrecked on an uncharted island here in the tropic sea. What a situation! The whole rhythm of my life was changed. <laughs> Modern nature had lots of fun Teaching me natural adaptation From bamboo leaves I built a hut My diet was the milk of the coconut I lived the life of Robinson Crusoe If you had the chance, wouldn't you do so? Yes, nature says you can't argue with that Each creature has its own natural habitat tat. Hmm? What's this? A feet print It looks like... No, it's impossible a penguin! Good grief, man! What are you doing thousands of miles away from your natural habitat? Don't you realize you cannot possibly survive in this climate? Besides, you are fouling up my pet theories on natural adaptation. Don't you understand? Capiche? Comprenez-vous? Verstehen Sie? Se habla espanol? Well, he didn't dig me, and I didn't dig him. But finally, we hit on something we could both dig. The international language, Sanskrit, which naturally means hiding in sand. And that's how I finally pieced together the oddball saga of this oddball bird. Now, the South Pole is the natural habitat of these penguins, and most of them wouldn't live anywhere else if you asked them to. Where would you find better weather for fishing? Ski, tobogganing, or swimming. And there's nothing the average penguin likes better than a day at the beach with the kiddies. But this story is about our friend Pablo. Let's go over and meet him. He lived down at the end of Main Street. Let's go inside and see what's cooking. You are now entering the world's most unusual exhibit. Curious creatures from mythology. They are creations of man's imagination. They are divided in homogenized or half-and-half -half creatures, like centaurs, sphinxes, mermaids, unicorns, and foolinixes. And in creatures that has got wings, like the winged lion of Venice, the winged bulls of ancient Assyria and Persia, and, of course, the Greeks had Pegasus, the famous flying horse. But who has ever heard of a flying jackass? <laughs> well, the professor has, and that's him up here on top of this pedestal, right where I am, and this is me. What are you looking at me for? I didn't mean me. <laughs> this is the place reserved for him, if and when I catch him. Incredible? Well, I saw him with my own eyes. But the original discoverer of this baffling oddball was a little boy who was just nuts about bird's eggs. Always climbing around in the Andes Mountains looking for nests. And for those who don't believe this story, here is positive proof. My ticket to the horse race. And if that's not enough, you can see I lost my shirt. As we have seen, there is two types of creatures. Normal, like you and me, and what is called freaks of nature. But to learn what causes such oddballs, we must go to the new science of genetics, also known as the laws of inheritance, which says that whatever you inherit, 50% of or more goes to Uncle Sam. And that's what, what am I saying? That isn't what it says. The law of inheritance says from your mommy and daddy, you get genes and chromosomes. And they determine the color of your eyes, the type and color of your hair, 
blood type A, B, O, or X, Y, Z, whatever you got. But especially physical build, like size, height, looks, and shape. And as you can see, the professor's forebears was in pretty good shape. Huh. To put it simply, chromosomes contains genes made up of macromolecules composed of dioxyribose nucleic acid carrying coded blueprints of all inheritance factors transmitted to the 50 trillion cells of your body. <laughs> That's the law. And when it is broken, then we have what is called a freak of nature. Now, some time ago, I heard of a strange genetic case just like that, which happened in a herd of huge elephants. So, I was on my way at once. I didn't know what to expect. But I was prepared for anything. Nothing could deter me from my mission to find this genetic wonder. Finally, there he was in my telescopic sight. He must have been miles away, but he loomed on the horizon, a veritable colossus. Hi. Good heavens, but this? A pre-shrunk elephant. I'm Goliath the second. Astoundingling. A rare throwback. Do you realize, little fella, that your daddy's genes and chromosomes must have gone completely kaflui? Oh, I didn't mean to hurt your little feelings. <laughs> I think you're as cute as a bug. Oh, bless his little heart. to think of the dangers this precious bit of life was facing in those ferocious woods. What problems of adjustment he must have had in a family of jungle giants. So I stuck around to see what would happen. And here is the long and the very short of it. <laughs> 